My name is uh, Carl Adams. I'm from uh, St. FX uh, University, St. Francis Xavier University. I'm the regional coordinator uh, in the Atlantic provinces for the 2023 uh, lecture tour. All questions will be handled at the conclusion of the speaker's presentation. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our host for today's CAP lecture tour talk, uh, Professor Catherine Lovkin from Physics and Astronomy Department at Mount Allison University, who will introduce our speaker. Before we begin with the CAP stuff, I would like to acknowledge that here at Mount Allison, we are on located in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional unceded lands of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, so welcome all of you to the very first CAP lecture of the 2023 season. We welcome the audience that is participating both here in the room and virtually online. We are very glad to have all of you here. The lecture tour series is uh, uh, sponsored by the CAP Foundation and uh, the Canadian Association of Physicists, which is a network of over 1,700 physicists. And the CAP Association works on behalf of physicists across Canada, supporting physics education, research, and sponsors a number of physics activities, including this lecture tour and some national research conferences. It offers a number of programs for students, for undergraduates in particular. There are research conferences, scholarships and prizes, and there's also a student advisory council. If you have not joined CAP already, I encourage you to join. It's free for undergraduate students and graduate students are, their membership is free for the first year. It gives me great pleasure then to introduce Dr. Cliff Burgess from McMaster University as our speaker today. Dr. Burgess's research focuses on high energy theory and today his talk is entitled, Thinking Effectively About Gravity. Well, thank you for the chance to speak. Before I start the talk, I wanna actually you know, like all good drugs, the CAP is free when you first start, and then they'll start charging for you later on. <laughs> and it's, uh, it, you should really, it really is worth joining. I, I went to two undergraduate conferences when I was an undergraduate, and they changed my career in the sense that I, my choices for grad school uh, were altered by what I saw in these meetings. So it really is a worthwhile organization. So uh, it's one of those drugs that it's good to take. So please do. <laughs> Thank you for the chance to speak. Uh, I'd like to talk about thinking effectively about gravity, the view from below. The view from below is important there. And the, uh, the basic pitch is, you know, so we're in this weird time. General relativity is their theory of gravity and it's being tested incredibly accurately in, in incre incredibly many ways. And I'll talk about what some of them are. And it works really well, passes all the tests with flying colors. And yet the literature is full of people trying to modify it. And so, uh, you know, what's with that? Why, why, why are you trying to modify it if, you, if it's working so well? I and mean, what, what's the problem? So the point of the talk will be, be threefold. So I'm gonna first off, start off with the, the GR is king. That's gonna be how general relativity is, is passing all these great tests and how the tests are so incredibly more detailed than they used to be. The GR dead part is why people are still not happy. And so what it is that they're trying to do when they modify it and different people have different motivations. So there's gonna be categories of motivations that I'll get to. And then the real meat is in the third part because the third part is, is things aren't so bad. One of the problems you'll see is how do you reconcile relativity with quantum mechanics? And if you read only things that were written in the sixties and earlier by, you know, by luminaries like Feynman and Dirac, you would have thought that there was a real crisis there that, that you had to have half of your brain knew about gravity but didn't know about quantum mechanics and the other half didn't know about quantum mechanics, but did know about gravity or the other way around. And it's not that bad. There really is a one picture in which gravity and quantum mechanics play together very nicely in all of the areas where it's being tested. And so the third point here is describing that synthesis, which we have, and we should be happy we have it, but it teaches us something about where the problems really are. And that's what the last part will be. I'm gonna, I'm gonna not actually talk much about explicit modifications of gravity, but I'll rank them all and I'll give you a, a kind of a drive-by um, sneering at various choices. And, 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 but the, the most important thing is that, is that there, there is a criterion that you can use to rank them. And so we should use that criterion. I may not all agree in the ranking, but the fact that there's a criterion is the important part. So just to start everybody off, you know, the, you know, the story starts essentially uh, in 1905 when special relativity comes in because at, at that point, every force law in the business is now obsolete because 
Special relativity is basically inconsistent with uh, instantaneous forces acting at a distance. And so everybody had to rethink things in terms of for, uh, fields. And I remember, you know, when, when I learned about fields in first year physics or whatever it was, it always seemed like a, such a waste of time because, you know, very nice force law. I have a mass, you have a mass. So I feel a force to you and you feel a force to me. Seems like that's very uh, concise. And now with the field thing, I have to think, well, I have a mass, so I set up a field and then you feel the field and then you get a force from the field and it's the same force. And so what was the field for? It seemed like it's a waste of time. And that was, it was a waste of time in first year physics because mm -hmm. nothing moved. Uh, and so the reason it's important is, you know, if, if, if I feel a force and, and you feel a force, but then you move, Newton would have said that I didn't have to look at you. I could just, where's the force pointing and I'll know where you are. Whereas what we, really happens is that you move and then there's a certain amount of time during which the force that I feel thinks you're still there. And then it's only eventually that the, the news moves through the field and gets to me. And then once it gets to me, then I, then I realize, oh, the force is over there now, but you've already, even though you've moved some time ago. So it's that propagation of things in time and non-instantaneous flavor, which is what you needed for relativity. That's kind of why forces had to go, but fields could survive. And so immediately Einstein and others knew so you're looking for something to replace the inverse square law force. What is it? And so people tried. It's actually interesting to read about it because they tried all the stupid things you, you know, we would have tried. Uh, but the, the key clue was, it takes about 10 years for them to figure it out. But the key clue was uh, this observation that the, the principle of equivalence, that there's a fine line between if you're in a constant gravitational field and you're, and, uh, you're, you're following with equal accelerations, the difference between that and being in a, an elevator that's accelerating in the opposite direction that they seem indistinguishable. And that has two clues, actually. One clue is whatever your story is about gravity, it has to partly be about describing your motion. So it's the coordinates you're using to describe how you're moving, because this sounds like a lot like centrifugal force. It's one of those things that's a fictitious force. And so there's going to be part of your story will be talking about how you're moving through space time. And so it's a, a coordinate story. But sometimes people take away the message that that means gravity is a fictitious force. And it's not, that's not the message. If, if you had been in this elevator, you know, you could really tell if you're in a gravitational field because what would really happen is that you'd fall towards the, uh, your, you'd fall towards the earth. And so that the, the point is that you're falling towards the center of the earth. And so um, what that means is that, you know, if you really wanted to know, am I in an elevator or not, you'd ask, you know, are the forces of gravity that the apples are feeling parallel or not? And that's the, the second message of this thought experiment is that the, the, the first message was part of the description of gravity will be the description of space time. But the gravity part of it will be specifically curvature. It's this differences in the forces as you, uh, you move in, in position. So the, the fact that these two apples don't feel exactly the same force, that's the gravity gravitational field. And in the language of geometry, that's the curvature part of the, 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 the story of space time. And so you're led towards, a picture where, and this is the beautiful part, you know, you would, uh, we've always thought of physics taking place in space and time, but now, and then since 1905, it was taking place in space time. But now the picture is that that's not a passive player. It's actually one of the things that needs laws to describe it. And there will be predictions for what space time does given distributions of matter. And there'll be, uh, and there's like now all the things to do with the geometry of space time are now experimental questions. How many dimensions are there? How do you respond to things? What's the topology of space time? And so all I need you to know about this for the rest of the talk is basically two things. And so I'm going to say a little bit about what it means to describe the curvature of space and time. So, so the way you describe space and time mathematically is, is, is you give a little, at every point in space, you describe if I have a little coordinate displacement in all different directions, dx, dy, dz, what's the physical distance that that corresponds to? And it's like, a, it's basically, it's a little Pythagore Pythagorean theorem. And the only novel thing is, that you imagine that your Pythagorean rules change as a function of where you are in space time. And so you have to specify what's called a metric here, the, this matrix of uh, things that are giving you this Pythagorean rule. Now the curvature is built from that and it's derivative of that. And, and there's a, a fairly obscure uh, rule. You, you take the inverse of this matrix G mu nu and you differentiate the matrix, you multiply them together. Then you differentiate that, that thing and you square it and you add them together. So there's some rule. All you need to know about the rule is that the curvature what I'm calling R here involves two derivatives of the metric. So it's a second derivative description of the, whatever you're using to describe the geometry. Now, once you have the curvature, Einstein gives you a rule for figuring out what the 
the, uh, the, there's a rule for finding out the curvature given the distribution of matter in the universe. And there's a rule for how things move given the, the geometry of the universe, which I won't go into in detail. But if you're, just to, to finish the thought here, the way the professionals deal with this is that uh, what you take, what you do with this curvature is you build a Hamiltonian or a Lagrangian from it as you would have done in any classical system. And that involves an, an, a constant. Uh, you take the curvature, they, it's, it's linear in the curvature with a proportionality constant, which is built from Newton's constant. It's a, it's a mass, which can be built from Newton's constant by combining it with h bar and c. And uh, you, you do with that what you would have done with any other kind of physics. You, if you're doing classical physics, then you would build an action from it by integrating the Lagrangian and you vary it to get equations of motion. If you're doing quantum mechanics and you do integrals over it, uh, uh, the, 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 the metric weighted by e to the i action and all the other rules of physics are the same. And the only thing that's important here is that the, the, the variable that you're following is this metric, which is describing the geometry. And the curvature plays an important role, which has two derivatives. That's what I need you to know. And immediately, as soon as you propose that, there was a big successes. Three classical ones were the precession of the orbit of, 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 of uh, Mercury. It's, not, it's gonna classically, it would have been ellipse, but it's being perturbed. And of course, Newtonian perturbations from the other planets would have also make it perturbed, but there was a missing 42 arc, sec, 42 arc seconds per century that hadn't been understood and which relativistic corrections uh, accounted for. There was the, the bending of uh, light by the sun. So if you look at three stars in the sky, and then you look at them again when the sun's in between, which you can only then see them during an eclipse, then they, they move away. They move apart because the light from them has bent around the sun. And so the, if you extrapolate back as your mind does, they look like they're farther apart. So if you kind of compare what the stars did, they kind of separated by a measurable amount. And of course that was seen uh, immediately after the prediction. And then the other one is the, the red shifting of, of light, that if you, things that are cl light climbing out of a gravitational potential loses energy, energy is, fre is frequency. And so that's kind of not a big deal that you're gonna change the color of light when it comes out of the gravitational field. The unusual thing is you don't change the speed of light. And normally when you change the energy, you change the speed, but not so for light. Um, but those are all immediately were tested and they were very successful. But now those are the kind of boring parts of the tests. There's, there's, there's spectacular tests that are going on uh, now and, and every year they're getting better. So the lensing part, you know, instead of looking at things coming around the sun, now it's kind of mundane that you see galaxies behind other galaxies. So here's a cluster of galaxies. And then these blue arcs are a galaxy that's behind it. And you're seeing the light from it in multiple paths because it's been bent. So that's strong lensing. You also see weak lensing where the shapes of galaxies are changing because the light is being bent. And if you think of them as being on average, having all orientation, so they're on average spherical, then by statistically looking at their shapes, you can identify the mass that has to be between you and them. And that's the way, that's one way in which people survey how much mass is in the universe. The world is full of relativistic things that gravitate, uh, neutron stars and pulsars. If you did not have relativistic gravity, you could not understand their structure as well as you do. Black holes are, I, I'm old enough to remember when it was, they, thought, they were thought to be hypothetical but they're, they're, they're like dirt everywhere in space. Um, and one of the reasons why people, they, they, they're, they're, they were originally detected because they produce so much energy, they can produce 10% of the rest mass of stuff falling into a black hole can come out as one of these energetic beams. Uh, and for comparison, you remember nuclear physics, the binding energies of nuclei are like 1% of the mass of the nuclei. So nuclear reactions are giving you 1% of the energy. So this is way more energy than you would have gotten from that kind of a thing. And so the fact that you've got these astrophysical systems that produce that much energy is, and it's all coming from a very small region in space, was uh, built up the evidence that these black holes existed. This, this, you know, if you're thinking of space-time as being the manifestation of gravity, now you can ask what's the geometry of space as a whole, given the measurements of where matter is as a whole. And that's a hugely successful area. What you're looking at here is the microwave background. The universe was cooling at one point. The universe used to be full of electrons and protons, and it was too hot in those days for atoms to form because whenever they formed, but every time they formed, they got knocked apart because it was so hot and they, they, they dissociated again. But as the universe cooled, it, it, as the universe expanded, it cooled, and eventually they no longer got knocked apart. And so the universe went from a plasma of electrons and nuclei to a a gas of neutral hydrogen, basically. And at that point it became opaque. It, it, it was opaque and it became transparent because the charged particles scattered light very effectively, but the neutral atoms don't. 
And so that light that was bouncing around then is still there. It's just no longer bouncing. And so we see it and that's the, what you're seeing in these pictures is the temperature of that hydrogen gas when it last talked to the light uh, in the early days of the universe. And, and so the, the, that whole story and the properties of the light is a huge success of general relativity. And you're not allowed to show this. You, you take away your, your physics card if you don't show that the Stephen Hawking's initials are in that, in that, uh, that picture. <laughs> that, uh, once you see it, you can never not see it. In, in the solar system, you know, the gravitational fields are not strong, but we send things out there and we measure their positions super accurately for long periods of time. And so now what people do is they, they say, well, supposing I had some random spherically symmetric geometry in the solar system, I could ask how would things move in that geometry? And then I can compare that to the specific metric that general relativity tells me should be there. And there's a parameterization of those metrics. Uh, and two of the parameters are gamma and beta. And you normally choose these parameters so that gamma and beta and whatever else equal to one is the general relativity choice. And now you can quantify how close we are to what general relativity says should happen. And uh, in this case, the gamma minus one is the best one. It's uh, like 10 to the minus five is, is the upper limit on what it can be. And the way that that's obtained is that comes from the Cassini spacecraft that was at Saturn. And some of the time that it's sending signals back and forth to the earth all the time, but every once in a while the sun is in between. And so it's sending them by the sun. And what happens is that the relativity, the gravitational field of the sun changes the, the, the you know, relativity is changing how time works. And so time evolves differently near the sun than it does uh, out of Saturn's orbit. And so you can measure by timing the, 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 the comparing how long you think the signal should have taken if there, there were no relativistic effects to how long they actually do take, you can measure an, a, a, what's called the Shapiro time delay as these signals go by the sun. And the, the fact that that works so well is what gives you this, this particular limit of 10 to the minus five. There are binary pulsars. Pulsars are these neutron stars. They, they, they beam energy out and the, they, they're rotating. And so those beams sweep by you. And so they pulse very, very regularly. It's like someone's given us very accurate clocks all around the, the galaxy. And uh, by, you can measure every once in a while, they end, end up orbiting other things. And in that case, by looking at the Doppler signal from the pulsar, you can detect the properties of the orbit. You can sometimes detect that there's other things in the orbit too, like planets. Um, and one of the things that happens is that people can measure the, the, they've been watching these things for decades. You can measure the period of the orbit so accurately that you can see that the period's getting longer very slowly. And that's interpreted to be because general relativity says that if you have a moving source, these waves have to be going out to tell the, the, the information that the sources have moved, but they carry energy away and that, 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 that makes the orbit decay. And what you see in this plot is a comparison for one of the particular, the, this is the Hulse-Taylor pulsar. It's a, the, the dots are the measurement of, the, of the, 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 the measured period decrease of the orbit. The period goes down because you know, as you spiral in, you start to go around faster and faster. So the period gets smaller. And the line is the projection of general relativity. And, and you might think, that that's a good fit, but that's actually not a fit. That, that, that's the, the curve, the theory curve was found by fitting to something else. And then this is just a prediction. And the errors, the error bars are on that curve, but you can't see them because they're so small. So it's a huge, it's a huge success of general relativity. The fit that was done. So what you're looking at here is the thing you don't know in general relativity in, in, in the binary pulsar is, what is what's the mass of the, the pulsar and what's the mass of the thing it's orbiting. So the thing that's fit is that. And so what they do is you can measure more than just the, the decay of the orbit, you can measure all the things that you measure in the solar system, the, the, the precession of the orbit, the, like the one for Mercury. You can measure the time dilation because things are moving. You can measure the Shapiro time delay. If, if the light from the pulsar goes by the source, that same Shapiro effect that we measure for Saturn should be there. And those are all measured. And so what should happen, so what, so what you're seeing in this plot here is, for example, this, this red line, the, the P dot curve, is that the two axes are the mass of the, of the two objects, the thing, the pulsar and the other, and the thing it's orbiting. And the red line is the curve that relativity says that you should be getting as a function of those masses. There are errors in the prediction for the period decrease, uh, which you can't see because they're so small. But the other curves here, like for example, the uh, omega dot here, uh, this, this, is, uh, this is the period precession as, as, as for Mercury. And, it's, and these two horizontal lines are giving you the range that you could be in consistent with the measurement. And S and R are two of the parameters that go into the Shapiro time delay. And there's two of them because in the solar system, we're always looking edge on the orbit, but for the pulsar, the, the orbit could be aligned in some way. So there's two parameters. That, one of the parameters describes the alignment and the other one is the one that you'd measure in the solar system. And those are 
Uh, one of those is called S, and you have to live between these two lines for the measurement of S. And for uh, gamma is the measurement of the relativistic time dilation. And so there's a bunch of, uh, of, of strips here that you have to live in, each one of which is a prediction of general relativity. And if general relativity is true, they have to all give you the same pair of masses, if that's what's really going on here. So all these strips have to overlap at a spot. And they do. And, and it's uh, you can't you can zoom in and you can, it's very impressive how they overlap here. But, it, but right here is where, for example, that, that line had to cross, that line had to cross the red line. And they all do there. And if you zoom right in, there's a little box that they all sit inside. So some of these measurements are not so good, but some of them are very good. That's for the, the, the top, top last one is the pulsar that I was showing you the prediction for. So what they did is they found the masses from that process. And then they went and said, well, now what does it look like as a function of time? And that's the, what they compared to in the previous slide. But these are other pulsars, these other boxes. And you see that the same thing's true for all of them. They haven't been watched for so long. So sometimes the boxes are larger, but it's always true that these things are overlapping in a place where general relativity says they must. The one on the bottom right is the most interesting one because it's actually a pulsar orbiting another pulsar. So there's more things you can measure because of that. And so that's why there's more curves there. And again, it's tr the, the gray area you can't live in because nothing would make sense in that case. But it's also true here that you live inside the uh, very narrow window that you have to live for general rel relativity to be true. So there's a very, very deep and uh, precise testing of, of relativity here. And that used to be the story of gravitational waves, but you now know that, that as of the, you know, several years ago, now gravitational waves have been seen on earth. You see black holes that are merging. And as they merge, they, 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 they radiate radiation that's, that's gravitational radiation that's set by the frequency of their orbit, which is getting faster as they spiral in. So it's called a chirp. And um, it's been measured by several detectors and the blue and the orange curves are giving you the, the, what they each got corrected for the fact that gravitational wave had to go different distances to get to the two detectors. And it's a, it's a remarkable testing of, of general relativity. It's also for the first time you're seeing black holes that are not bright. And it's you know, the difference between that and what we used to do is like, if, you, if all you knew about people was what was in People magazine, that was what we used to do. We, we just saw the celebrities. But now you're just seeing garden variety black holes that are out there. And so you can say something about the populations as a whole. So it's a remarkable time for gravitational physics. The last one is people test things on Earth. You take a mass, take another mass, you ask how, how, how well are they pulling on each other? They're all testing different kinds of regimes. You get kind of constraints in this bottom left plot here. The vertical axis is, is, is a, has, you compare it to a hypothetical different force. If there existed some non-gravitational, non-general relativity force, and they parameterize the range of the force across the bottom and the, and the strength of the force relative to gravity uh, and the vertical axis. And you see that, so one would be gravity. And gravity is the weakest force by far, but one is, on the, is off the top of the plot here. So down here, the best one is what's called LLR. That's lunar laser ranging. So that's at 10 to the minus 10 of gravity. That's such a strong test because once, once people put mirrors on the, on the moon, which they did in 1969, you can shine lasers from them. And so you can now measure the properties of the lunar orbit, including its distance from us to within millimeters. It doesn't mean that you know where the moon is to within a millimeter now. It means that if you take the model of where the moon is along its orbit using, relative, using uh, celestial mechanics, the parameter describing the size of the orbit is, has an, an error of, of, a, of the order of a millimeter. And so you can test whether or not the Earth and the Moon, which have a different chemical composition, are falling towards the Sun with the same speed. And that's, uh, that's the test that you're seeing here. It's incredibly accurate tests. And so it's not that general relativity works, kind of. It works in really exquisite detail. So you say, why aren't you happy with that? <laughs> and many people are, of course. But there's problems with relativity. And the, the, the famous one is the consistency with quantum mechanics. And the problem there is, is actually fairly simple to describe. It's, it's, it's a basic problem with the uncertainty principle. If you believe that geometry is how gravity is expressed, the way you test that is you send a fleet of measurement people out who have very good rulers and very good clocks to measure where they are. So you can measure all the distances and say, well, that's the geometry that I thought I was gonna get in that circumstance. But the one thing you ask of those people is, they be super light because you don't want them to be curving the space they're in. You want them to be just registering the space they're in, but they have to also, so there's two things you ask. The second thing you ask is that they're very accurate in their measurements of position and, and, and energy. And so imagine you wanna measure the curvature. The curvature has the units of one over length squared. And so if you think of the curvature of a, of a curve, the radius of curvature is kind of giving you a measure of the, how much the curve bends. 
the shorter the radius, the sharper the bend. So the higher the curvature, the smaller the radius of curvature. So if you want to test the prediction for curvature, you want to be able to do measurements of position that are better than, smaller than the radius of curvature you're trying to test. But Heisenberg says, if you measure something that accurately, your momentum is uncertain by that much, at least. And momentum multiplied by the speed of light for relativistic part particles, and you've got the uncertainty and the energy that they're going to have. They have an energy. Energy doesn't matter for gravity. Gravity cares about energy density. So if, if you had that much energy in this region you're trying to measure, that would correspond to at least this much energy density. But if you have that much energy density, Einstein tells you how much curvature you get, and it's this much. So it's given by Newton's constant times the energy density over c to the fourth. And so if you want the curvature that you thought you're trying to measure to be bigger than this upper limit to how big you can have, uh, the, 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 you want the curvature that you're getting from the measurement to be smaller than the curvature that whose curvature you were trying to measure in the first place. And so that turns out to be a, a lower limit on the size of the curvature, which is an upper limit on the curvature, uh, which is set by the Planck length because it's being controlled by Newton's constant. And so that's telling you that quantum mechanics is going to fundamentally be a problem for mapping out space time, but it's really only a problem at the Planck length necessarily. And the Planck length is 10 to the minus 30 something centimeters. And so it's nothing, it's not a problem in the solar system. It's a problem in principle, but not necessarily a problem in practice. Now people, you, you make that argument and say, oh yeah, so what? I, 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 I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to try and ask what general relativity would say quantum mechanically. And if you do that, I want to show you what really what it was that bothered people really. And it was really that, that you got sent nonsensical predictions when you tried to do uh, calculations. So you remember our story was that general relativity involved two derivatives of the metric. So what you do, let's, let's say we imagine scattering gravitational waves from each other. And we ask, what's the likelihood of that happening quantum mechanically? Quantum mechanically, the waves will be described by quanta. Those will be gravitons. And so what you do is you take the metric to be some background metric, say it's flat space, and you imagine a wave going through it. And then you ask, how does the wave interact with itself? And so, so you take the metric, so that's the top line here is showing you what the metric would look like. And so this h mu nu is the fluctuation in the metric. Uh, for dimensional grounds, I divide by this m Planck, which is in the, in the problem. And if I take that and I stick it into the, the Einstein story of what the, uh, the dynamics is in terms of the curvature, it has an expansion in powers of h. And this choice of the normalization of h uh, ensures that there's no m Planck's in the first term. But then once I've done that, all the things involving three H's and four H's and five H's, they all come with an extra one over M Planck. So now if I ask in the rules of quantum mechanics, what's the scattering rate? You can read them off from these interactions. What you basically do, the, uh, typically it's done through Feynman graphs, but the graph is just a mnemonic for how to read off in the amplitude what was uh, coming from the Hamiltonian or the, or the dynamics. And so, so in a graph, a vertex with four lines in it corresponds to an interaction which had four fields in it. So in this case, it would be the second interaction here. And so that has to become proportional to one over M Planck squared because that's the way it came in the, in the Lagrangian. So this amplitude for this graph would give you some contribution going like one over M Planck squared. The second graph involves two interactions which have three lines in them. So that's a cubic interaction and each of them has a one over M Planck, but there's two of them. So that means that I have to have that'll also contribute to order one over M Planck squared. So I should add those amplitudes because they're the same size. And if you do that, you know, the, on dimensional grounds, the amplitude is dimensionless. And so the remaining dimensions are coming from the energy of the scattering. And so you're expecting something that goes like the energy of the scattering squared, which I'm calling Q squared, divided by M Planck squared. And the real calculation is at the bottom right there. DeWitt did this in the 60s. And it's eight pi G, which is what one over M Planck squared was. And then the Q squared, the energy squared is, is S cubed over TU. And if you've done scattering and relativistic problems, those are standard variables, the Mandelstam variables. They're all proportional to the energy squared. So S cubed over TU is energy squared, but T and U have angles in them. So the scattering, the information of the likelihood of things with the function of angle are buried, is buried in that. So this counting kind of gives you the right answer of one over M Planck's. The problem was, if you look at corrections to this, then you look at things like this that have loops in them. And it happens that the momentum going around a loop is not dictated to you by momentum conservation. So you have to integrate over all of them that could have been there. But you count the M planks just like before. And so there's uh, four vertices here. And so there's gonna be four, uh, one over M planks. I forgot to emphasize that each interaction here has two derivatives because remember the curvature had two derivatives in it and the story was linear in curvature. So every interaction has exactly two derivatives and that'll show up as powers of momentum when you calculate these graphs. So I should, I've got four vertices. I should have four factors of momentum squared. So it's eight powers of momentum in the numerator. Turns out the lines 
correspond to denominators, which are these Q squareds plus P squareds, and there's four of them. That's why uh, that's where that factor came from. But there's essentially an algorithm that gives you the amplitude. And the important part is that just on these dimensional, using these, these counting the momenta and the implanks, you can see that the integral here is diverging when P goes to infinity, because I've got four integrals over P, and the numerator goes like P to the sixth over P to the eighth for large P. So I've got D4P over P squared. And if I think of D4P as being P cubed DP, then it, it, things are, are going to uh, hell in a handbasket at large energies. And, and for this first line, you wouldn't really care because you'd say that's a correction to the amplitude, which is proportional to Q squared. The first leading thing was proportional to Q squared and it had a coefficient, which was the, the Newton's constant. So this is just a correction to Newton's constant. And we didn't know what it was anyway. So we're gonna learn what the value of Newton's constant is. But the second term is also there where not all of these momenta have to be internal momenta, some could be external, and there's no way of absorbing this divergence in the second term into any of the parameters in your problem. And that's unlike what happens in electromagnetism. In electromagnetism, all these problems get absorbed into the electric charge of the electron and the mass of the electron, and then they're all gone. And so then you can make a sensible prediction, and you can't do that with gravity. That was the problem, the perceived problem in the 60s. Side, because that's the one in which people have made progress on. Let me just give you the other reasons that people use uh, have problems people have. One of them is dark matter and dark energy. Great story of cosmology. You have to buy that there's two things out there you don't know what the hell they are. And so you're inferring their existence from gravity. It's not a big stretch to think maybe you're inferring it wrong because your understanding of gravity is wrong. And for this, it's good to know that there's more than one line of evidence for dark matter and dark energy. It's like the existence of atoms 100 years ago. People believed in atoms way before you could see them because there were many, many ways of inferring their properties and they didn't have to all give you the same atom, same answer if there were no atoms, but they always did. And that's, that's what gave people uh, confidence that atoms existed. So for dark matter, the famous ones are, you look at how galaxies rotate and they rotate as if there's more matter than what you see. You look at clusters of galaxies and you can measure the uh, mass in a cluster of galaxies in three ways at least. You can see how the galaxies themselves are moving. You can see how the hot gas between the galaxies is moving. That's this pink. This is a composite of three things, X-ray picture, an ordinary picture, and then a, a, a weak lensing picture of this cluster of galaxies. You're looking at a cluster of galaxies here, two clusters actually. And the pink thing is showing you where the X-rays are coming from. And that's coming from hot gas between the galaxies. And you can ask, hot, hot means you're moving quickly. How much matter do you need to trap that much matter for long enough? And it gives you an answer similar to what the motion of the galaxies was. And the blue thing is looking at weak lensing to, to measure what's there. And they're all giving you the same answer is, is the main thing. So they're giving you consistent pictures to how much dark matter is in, in those things. But there's at least four other ways of doing it besides galaxies. There's this, the cosmology gives you several ways of looking at it, um, both from the microwave background and from where uh, nuclei, nu nuclei formed. And so there's uh, many, many ways of getting to the same thing and they're all consistent is the important part. Dark energy is similar, fewer lines of evidence, but there's more than one. So the first one is you look at, so this picture is of a star in front of a galaxy. That star is actually not in our galaxy. It's actually the same distance as the galaxy. It's as bright as the galaxy because it's a supernova. So people use supernovas. People believe that they can understand how bright supernovas are intrinsically. And so if you can measure how bright they appear to be, you can compare their distance to the redshift and you can test the, the redshift uh, distance relationship that is the Hubble's law. Uh, and people expected that the universe should be expanding but it should be true that the expanding should the expansion should be slowing down because everybody's attracting under gravity, and the, that means that uh, if I look at things that are farther away, I'm seeing them as they were in the past, so they should be moving faster. They, and so they sh should have been true that that uh, that the evidence should be that things were moving faster than I would have uh, I would have uh, would have assumed if I had just taken the straightforward non-accelerating expansion of the universe. And so they tested that uh, in the 90s and later using these supernovas because you could see them from so far away. And what they found was the acceleration is actually, the, the expansion is actually accelerating, not decelerating. And so dark matter can't do that because dark matter is also attractive. So that was a big surprise. And if you, there's a big error bars there. And if you kind of, uh, so what, if, what people do is they compare that, those curves to what you would expect in a model where the model has dark matter and it has, uh, another form of matter, which is chosen essentially to be the way that the vacuum would gravitate if it had an energy density. Uh, it turns out that that can allow you to have, uh, that can have negative pressure and so it can allow you to have an accelerating expansion. And what they plot here is they plot, this oval is the region that you have to live in to be consistent with these observations. And what's being plotted, the axes are, the vertical axis is how much of the vacuum energy you could have. And the units are 
that's an energy density, but the units are uh, one here means 10 to the minus 29 grams per cubic centimeter. And the same thing across the bottom is for the, the dark matter and the same units. And that unit is not random unit. That's the unit that corresponds to how much energy density we believe is out there on average. And we know that because Einstein says that geometry is related to the energy density. And in the microwave background, we're looking at hot and cold areas. We can measure the angle between them. And so what you're looking at is sound waves and hydrogen, hydrogen at the other side of the universe. So, so it's like someone gave us a ruler on the other side of the universe because we know how far sound goes. And so you can take the angle that you measure between those two things. You know the physical distance on the, on the other end because that's sound wave. You know how far away they are if you know how fast the universe is expanding. And so now you've got a triangle where you know both sides, all three sides and an angle, and that should be too much information in Euclidean geometry. So you can test if Euclidean geometry is true in the regime through which these light rays went. And the answer is it is, that the, all you should, you should have been able to get away with side, angle, side, or angle, side, angle, but you had side, 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 and angle. And, that, and what you find is consistent with Euclidean geometry. But Einstein says you can only have Euclidean geometry if your energy density is 10 to the minus 29 grams per cubic centimeter. So this line here is the line for which space at a given time is flat in the universe. And the measurements with CMB are this orange thing. And so, the, and the green line is just the measurement of the dark matter that we forget cosmology, or this is actually done with cosmology, but it's a measurement of dark matter abundance independent of these other two things. That's why it's basically vertical. It's just measuring dark matter. And the fact that they all overlap at the same place is telling you that you throw any one of those away, the other two still tell you that you have to be in this place where you have both dark energy and dark matter. So what people say, maybe, we should, maybe it's better understood by modifying gravity. There are conceptual puzzles, which I won't get into, but they, there's, there's problems with, with black holes, and, uh, but they're more hypothetical. And of course, big motivation is you figure out what's wrong with gravity, then you're tomorrow's Einstein, and 100 years from now, they're celebrating you and not him. And so there's many, many proposals, and I'm not going to go through any of them. I will mention again MOND. This is Modified Newtonian Dynamics. It was designed to describe galaxies. And the idea was you take Newton's force law is equal to ma, and you say, well, for sufficiently small a, the real law is, is equal to ma squared. And then that actually is a good description of galaxies. And so I'll come back to that. Turns out there's a bad description of other things. So now the, the solid part of what I'm gonna to say today is I wanna go back to this question of, of quantum mechanics and gravity and why it's not as bad as people thought it was. We actually have a picture where we understand what's going on with those divergences. And it's important because if you're testing gravity at all, part of that agreement is you're saying that the, the, the experiment and theory agree within the errors of both the experiment and theory. And so here, uh, here's an example of, uh, you know, this is a non-gravitational example. This is the anomalous magnetic, magnetic moment of the muon. It's, it's predicted to fantastic accuracy. It's measured to fantastic accuracy and they agree to within the errors and the errors are really, really small. And that's kind of one of the huge successes of theoretical physics in the 20th century. But th the thing is that in, in this prediction, it was important that all these corrections, you could make sense of them. And these divergences didn't matter because you could absorb them into the parameters you had in your problem. And so that was part of assessing what this theoretical error was. If you can't do that for gravity, you know, you're making very precise comparisons between measurements of the pulsar period, uh, spin uh, period change and the predictions. But what this error here is the error in not knowing what the masses of the pulses are. It's not an error to do with quantum mechanics. If you really believe that you had no idea how quantum mechanics interface with gravity, you'd have to say there was really an infinite error in the theory side, and it wouldn't make a lot of sense to test the classical predictions. And it's not that bad. We really have a really good idea for on distances this large, what the errors are with quantum mechanics because we understand how to deal with that divergence issue. And the, the resolution was that we should not think of gravity as being God gives us general relativity. We should think of it as that the, the theory, the world is, is, depends on curvature. We don't know exactly what the rules are for describing how the curvature evolves, but we know that whatever we, we're looking at for general relativity seems to work really well for weak curvature. So we should think that there's some sort of a fundamental theory of gravity, but we're seeing the weak curvature end of it. So we're doing a derivative expansion of what we could have imagined. We just imagine writing down anything in the Lagrangian, but keeping only the fewest derivatives. The first few terms there are general relativity, but there could also be corrections. And it's the existence of those corrections that allows you to take care of these divergences. And so I'm gonna skip something here, but I'll tell you, uh, this is a very precise connection. And it says that 
If I take an amplitude for graviton scattering, which has L loops and it has E external lines and it has V vertices and the vertices have I fields attached to them and K derivatives, the ones with K equals two are general relativity. Then this is what the, how the amplitude depends on the energy of the scattering and M Planck and all the scales in your problem. And if you wanna make this small, these ratios of energy divided by other things are all small. You wanna make this zero, this zero, this power zero. That means you wanna work at zero loops with no interactions which involve more than two derivatives that is classical general relativity. And then the first correction would be, allow that to be one and have these be zero. That's, that's one loop general relativity, but you could also be, keep this one be zero and make these guys not zero. And that's a classical contribution coming from one of these curvature squared terms. And so there's a, there's a very precise sense in which the classical approximation is controlled by a low energy approximation. And so we can quantify how, how badly broken it is in any situation. In the solar system, it works to one part in 10 to the 80, it turns out. So it's a really, really small error. But it's important conceptually that you know how to think of it. And it, there's a reason why these things could have, uh, would have, these other terms would have appeared, which I won't get into. The bottom line is that there's a very powerful picture that's emerged at low energies where if you ask in the same low energy limit uh, about the interactions that we think we understand, electromagnetism and gravity, the standard model, they all have the feature that they, if you say, I have these degrees of freedom and they have these symmetries or conserved properties. And I say, what's the most general thing I could have at low energies? In, in each case, it's the theory we think is right. So in, in gravity, the most general thing we can think of that describes long range couplings to energy is general relativity in the modern picture of quantum general relativity. For Maxwell's equations, the most general thing we could have, which is describing uh, long range interactions between charges and includes Coulomb interaction is Maxwell's equation. So that's why we believe that that's probably true. And the standard model is also the most general thing that involves the particles we've seen with the charges that we know that they have. And uh, so there's an inevitability from this low energy picture, which was uh, not evident to Einstein when he was writing these theories down. So now I'll do my drive-by. So I'm just about done. And uh, I wanna just give you a prejudice as to how do you assess, if someone sells you in the back of a truck what their theory of modified gravity is, you have a way of assessing whether you think it should be uh, it is likely to be something you want to invest in. So you remember, what were the reasons for not, uh, for thinking you should modify gravity? There were a whole bunch of them, but they kind of organized themselves in this picture of, of low energies versus high energies in the following way, that uh, the consistency with quantum mechanics, I argued, was a short distance problem. It was a problem at the Planck length, but it wasn't necessarily a problem in the solar system. These other things like uh, dark matter, dark energy, and these conceptual puzzles, those are all really cosmology. That's the longest distances we know about. So those are really trying to address very long distance problems. And then the fame and glory part is just a personal problem. <laughs> and then the theories that have been proposed, I kind of gave you a list. I didn't really tell you what they were. Uh, they can be sorted according to whether they're aiming at, low at, at long distance problems or short distance problems. And so these ones are aimed at long distances specifically. They're trying to change gravity at long distances to give you things like dark energy. These ones are kind of aimed at both things. There, there's, a, there's a class of theories where they're imagining that something could be going on at short distances, but then it's showing uh, effects at long distances too. And that's an interesting connection if it's there. And these ones are specifically aimed at small distances. And so they're, they're, things that, uh, they're aimed at things that we're not measuring. They're gonna be hard to test because it's typically true that small distance physics doesn't matter for long distance physics in practice. But it's true that they're asking very fundamental questions. So, uh, one, so one of the drive-by shots would be for the specific story of dark energy and dark matter, you can ask, so people have been looking for ways to modify gravity that's more efficient than talking about the evidence for dark matter and dark energy separately. Is there an example that people have been looking for it for you know, decades now? And the answer is that uh, there's lots of known ways to modify gravity at short distances, which would be consistent with what we know at long distances, but there's none yet, which has, uh, I, I'm actually, I'm showing you a slide, which is uh, words I've already said. It's uh, if you do things at short distances, it tends to be that long distances don't care much. That's kind of why science advances. We didn't need to know nuclear physics to understand atoms. And that's gives us confidence that long distance physics we can understand without understanding what's going on at short distances. But if you think you do understand what's going on at the Planck length, that's a problem because it becomes hard to predict anything that you can test because most of the things you're testing don't care what's going on at very short distances. That's kind of the, the thing that all quantum gravities fight, theories of quantum gravity fight. But the proposals for dark energy and dark, uh, dark matter, 
The problem is that there is no one proposal of modifying gravity that accounts for all of the lines of evidence for those things to exist. That's why it's important to have many lines of evidence. It turns out that it's very easy to make particle models of, of dark matter, for example. Uh, and that's every Tuesday a graduate student makes one because it's, uh, you don't need much. So if you rank these theories, this is the way I would rank them according to the, the mantra that short distance physics is where the problems are. It's easier to modify things there. Long distance physics is actually hard to modify in a consistent way. And uh, so you can see that there, there's a class of things that I like here, which are the, uh, the kind of vanilla, you add more particles essentially is the thing that's easy to do. And I've given a shaded uh, green there because there's a subclass of them, which is actually, uh, there's features at long distances. You're, you're, long distances are not sensitive to short distances mostly, but there are a few features that you are sensitive to. And then it depends on whether or not your theory agrees with those features or not. So let me close out because I've got four seconds left. I would say in passing that there's uh, no evidence for gravitational exceptionalism. Often people who do gravity don't wanna hear about other kinds of physics, but I think there's a lot, there's lots of ways in which other areas of physics inform the way to think about gravity and vice versa. Gravity actually has a lot to teach other areas of physics. So the bottom line, I would say in these two slides, Gravity is very likely, it's very successful. General relativity seems like it works really, really well, but all the tests are very long distances. It's very likely that gravity is modified, but it's very likely that it's modified at short distances because that's where the real problems are, like consistency of quantum mechanics with gravity. There's nothing about the modifications at small distances which makes inevitable that you should be seeing them at long distances. So it's not inconsistent that the tests are working very well at long distances, and yet you still have modifications at short distances. But there are proposals to modify things in long distances and they might be right. But the thing you have to always ask them is, does it, do they make sense? Do they understand why classical, what the people typically do is they give you a theory, they work its classical predictions out, but they don't ask why were the classical predictions a good approximation? And in general relativity, we understand that as a low energy expansion. And so a burden of proof on those kind of theories is, why do it, does it make sense to analyze things the way I do? What controls the quantum things on these long distances where I'm trying to test things and where we have access to observations. So that's generally a positive message, but with a strong negative slant towards things that are happening at long distances. But the positive side is that there's lots and lots of ways in which the non-gravitational physics can inform gravitational physics and vice versa. And it's not just particle physics that's doing it. I think some of the most interesting things about gravity now are to do with uh, horizons and 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 the, the fact that physics in a gravitational field is in many ways an open system, the way that you have in condensed matter physics or in optics. And so there's an interchange of ideas going on between areas of physics, which is extremely fruitful and it's not one way, it's going in both directions. And so there's a, the message in the end of the day is, is if you feel the need to modify gravity, modify it because there's lots of things that need modification, but take on board the message that modifications at short distances tend to hide themselves. And if you're interested in testing them and you have testable predictions, the question is why were classical approximations, which are usually what are used, good approximations? And they may be good, but it's just something which needs to be answered. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for some questions. You were talking about um, predictions and the, the things that we can measure on large scales versus small yeah. scales. Are some of the new uh, instruments that are coming online for cosmology, like DWST, Roman Telescope, there's a whole bunch of new stuff. Are those going to help pit any of this? Big down? time, yeah, yeah. This is a really exciting time for gravity. You can kind of see in the in, in 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 many fields people retooling themselves to think about gravity now because of these these measurements are going to be so powerful. And it's not just the cosmology ones, which will be powerful, because they're measuring for the first time the distribution of matter. You know as a function in three dimensions, you know, through the dark ages. And so there's, there's a whole period of the history of the universe where we didn't have a lot of information that we're about to get information on and, and chest, tests of gravity, that tests gravity in many ways. But the search for gravitational waves, now that we've seen them, it's like, it's, it's, it's like the early days of, of, of astronomy in the sense that there's, there's whole regions of the spectrum. We've seen gravitational waves with a very specific uh, set of frequencies coming from binary, you know, binary coalescence. But there should also be gravitational waves coming from the early universe. There should also be gravitational waves coming from many other sources, phase transitions in the early universe. universe uh, you know, 
it, as supernovas. The, 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 and, and there's many novel ways to test that. Once you start believing that you can see these things, you know, it turns out that this lunar laser, laser ranging is, a, is already a really great test for gravitational waves because that whole thing about, we know the position of the moon to a millimeter gets screwed up if you start having a gravitational wave go through and it starts moving periodically all the distances. And so people are starting to rethink creatively, what can I learn about physics in general, given that now gravitational waves are something I can see. And then that's, that's, I think in the next 10 years, that's going to revolutionize what we know about gravity. Um, so, so I kind of can picture like gravitational waves causing like expansion and compression as it occurs space time yeah. uh, for these laser experiments with LIGO or the urban moon one. Um, I don't understand though, if quantum mechanics says gravity, there's a graviton. Like what is the graviton doing that causes the space time to warp? If, if, if you can reconcile quantum, because you, you, you said like yeah. the, the, the yeah, that there is no uh, real inconsistency between quantum mechanics and general relativity. At long distances, yeah. Yeah, so I'm just wondering how, like, how can I picture, what is a graviton doing to cause space-time to work? The, the analogy with electromagnetism is really good. So, so if you think about electromagnetism, the difference between photons and classical electromagnetic waves. You know, the class, one way to think about classical electromagnetic wave is that you just have, because photons are bosons, you can have more than one in any one state. So if you have a, you know, a Avogadro's number of them, then it's really good. They behave very classically in the sense that the, the for fields, you know, the, 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 in quantum mechanics, you can't measure say momentum and position at the same time because they not, you can't, they don't commute with one another. In field theory, what happens is that the energy and the value of the field are, are variables like that that don't commute. And so when you talk about vacuum fluctuations, that's what you mean is that if I, if I know I'm looking at the vacuum or the ground or some energy eigenstate of the system, the, the electric field should be fluctuating. But if you have a lot of photons, it doesn't really fluctuate very much. And so it behaves like a classical field. And so the gravitational field would, would be like that, that the, these waves that you're looking at are gravitons, but you're, you're not seeing them. In, it's not like the detectors are clicking and you're seeing individual gravitons. You're seeing a shitload of gravitons, you know, and, and, and that's, making, that's giving you a big, what looks like a, a coherent field. And that field is what you're seeing the response to. But it's a very deep question at that small energy, at small distances, because because the picture that people, most people believe, although no one can prove it, is that probably this picture of space time being the field is an emergent thing, that, that if you have lots and lots of gravitons or lots and lots of energy, there will be a limit in which things look like classical fields. And then in the gravity case, that'll look like space time. But on short distances, it might not be like that. It might be something completely different going on. But it's hard to pin that down a little bit. Thank you. That helps a lot. Just to make sure, a graviton has never been measured, right? Like well, so, so it depends. So individually, no, but in a shitload, yes. <laughs> what, do they, they, what do you mean it's in a shitload? It's been detected. Because well, we've seen gravitational waves, and so so if you believe that quantum mechanics is true, and you think that general relativity is true, then you you those waves were gravitons, and you've seen many of them. So, but but normally, what people mean when they say "Have you seen a graviton?" they, they mean "Have you seen one?" Because that's what we meant for photons, right? That we saw, we saw electromagnetic waves hundreds of years ago, or hundred years ago. But the you didn't really believe you'd seen photons until you saw the detectors that you, you got a click when the photon arrived, and then you saw the distribution of photons did with the classical field set. And no one's done the click measurement for gravitons. But I think you know if for that not to be happening, what's going on? You'd have to give up something very fundamental. Either general general, general relativity is wrong, or quantum mechanics is wrong. Could but if you both be wrong, they could both be wrong. <laughs> They could both be wrong. There's no evidence that either of them is wrong. You know, the, what I like about teaching those two subjects as an undergraduate, those are the few subjects where you're not lying to your students because we think they're true. You know, we don't think there's no exceptions to when they're, they're working. And so those two things would mean that these waves are gravitons. And it might be true that there's something going on we don't understand, but there's no evidence that there's anything going on that we don't understand there. And just to follow up, gravitons, are they the ones that cause gravity or the ones that curve space time? How does that, how does this? They are, they are the, so in a sense that a gravitational wave is a, a wave in space and time itself in the curvature of space time. And they, the gravitons are the quanta of those waves in exactly the analog of photons to electromagnetic waves. So it's not like sound, it's like a, a particle that. It's very much like sound. If you think of sound as being a, a field, so there's a, some, position field that's vibrating, then the wave in that field has quanta, which are phonons. And then, so it's very much like that as well. 
is it problem? Is it possible that we've reached a stumbling block in finding a description that both scales up and scales down nicely simply because we just don't have the correct mathematical tools yet at this point? That's always possible. You know, you never know. But there's no evidence that that's happened. So the conservative thing to do is take the tools we have and push them to their limit, right? And that's that's what most people do. But there is a subfield, subclass of researchers that that you know go for the hail mary pass, <laughs> and maybe there's something going on that you can kind of guess. But I would say that uh, in history, you know, I'm kind of probably conservative in this, but if you look at the history of how science has progressed in the 1600s, people were wondering, you know, what's the shape of the universe? And, and they were kind of look, going for the, the Hail Mary pass. And then some people at that time were, were, were worrying about how apples fall, right? And if you think about now, who taught us what the shape of the universe was, it was the apple falling people that did it because that led to Newton and then other Einstein. And then, then there was a connection to, to geometry. And then there was really something by pushing at what you can solve you end up solving very big questions. And just because the question's interesting doesn't mean it's solvable right now. <laughs> so you're kind of, everyone's making a judgment call as to where their, their efforts are gonna be fruitful. And that's an important part of it, I would say. Can you elaborate on why GR specifically is the best classical approximation to an underlying quantum gravity theory? Uh, yeah, well, that's sure. That, that's, a, that's a good question. The, um, there's a sense in which, and so what I'm skating over here is, is uh, is it used to be when I was a student that people, it was, it was already hard to get special relativity to work with quantum mechanics. And, but, it, it, but it worked, you can make it work. The, the reason it's hard is that the, the, in, in relativity, you, you don't, everybody doesn't agree on the ordering of events in space and time. So people can say this one's first and this one's second, and other people can say that one's first, that one's second, as long as they're far enough apart that light can't get between them. And that causality problem, once you introduce Heisenberg's uncertainty principle becomes a real problem because in quantum mechanics, you could get, the, they can influence each other, even though classically they couldn't because things can't go faster than the speed of light. So I guess I'm saying it backwards. Einstein knew that when he did relativity, if you're going to have, if you can't agree on the ordering of events and times, you've got a potential problem predicting things, but he got away with it because he also said you can't go faster than the speed of light. And so you, you don't see the problem. Anything that can be influenced at the speed of light, everybody agrees on the ordering in time. But then when quantum mechanics came in, they realized that you have to now rethink that because the, uh, the uncertainty principle says that even if you thought that you could, weren't going faster than the speed of light, you might be wrong because your uncertainty principle says you're going faster than you thought. And it turns out in quantum mechanics, you can, these things that are, uh, that, that are, that you're disagreeing on the ordering of in time can influence one another, but it works in quantum mechanics because only because antiparticles exist. If you think that something went that way between those events, because that was earlier and that was later, and it carried some charge, there has to be a story where someone could say it went the other way, and that's what the antiparticles do for you. So there's a very delicate thing that worked to make special relativity consistent with quantum mechanics. And in the old days, when I was a student, people thought, well, that's great. Now there's a smaller class of theories. Now we have to find the one that has gravity in it. That's probably the right one. And the problem was there were no theories that had gravity in it. And that's because um, it turns out that it's very restrictive, even more restrictive to try and get gravity to work in a quantum mechanical system. And that's why it took so long to figure out this thing about low energies, the story I told you about how people make predictions with quantum mechanics and gravity. And it turns out that the, if you ask that the, um, that you're meeting a force that the, for which energy is a source, and if you ask that it's an infinitely long range force, and if you ask that the strength of the coupling is not derivatively suppressed, so it's something which includes Newton's force, then the only known way to do that is to have a massless spin two thing. And the only known way to do that is to, that, that, that's a graviton, and the only known way to have that interact at low energies is general relativity, as far as we know. And so, so now the picture of general relativity is that you can derive it from special relativity, the observation that we see that there are long range forces that are in play uh, between masses uh, and th that they, they survive at low energies. And, and so there's, there's a sense in which general relativity is as inevitable as Maxwell's equations are for electromagnetism. And it does at low energies. So the argument is, is explicitly at very low energies and very long distances. At, at short distances, then all bets are off and you can do whatever you like. All right. So that was the last question. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the national coordinator of the CAP lecture tour, uh, Gwen uh, Granier, uh, the staff in the CAP office, uh, the university coordinator, and host uh, Catherine Lovkin of Mount Allison University for helping organize today's talk. Um, of course, thank you to Dr. Cliff Burgess for an excellent presentation and thank you all for participating.
I'd also like to thank uh, Science Atlantic, uh, who is a co-sponsor of this leg of the lecture tour. And I'd like to also announce uh, the next talk in the series by uh, Professor Rowan Thompson. Uh, it takes place on Tuesday, February 7th at 6 p.m. Eastern, titled Curing Cancer with Physics, Multiscale Modeling from Patients to Cells.